I know we're live. Everybody's telling me we're live. Um, I live live. Um, hey, man, congratulations on the raise this week. Boom. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it uh, it was not exactly what we had planned. Uh, it was preempted. And so um, it's the kind of thing where we've been very blessed and very lucky so far in this process where a lot of really great um, investors and strategics have wanted to sort of back the team and back the idea, I guess, the right product, the right place and the right time, right? Pretty good problem to have, man. Most of us would uh, really like to have that problem out there in the world uh, where people are throwing money at you, not literally, but feels that way. <laughs> well, uh, I, listen, I wish it was that way. Look, th this is a crazy time for all of us. Um, the last couple of months of you and I putting our heads together and talking to a lot of different industry leaders about what the heck to do in this new normal. Had, you know, it, it's been um, it's been pivoting uh, companies. You, you've pivoted your organization as events have changed to virtual. Uh, you know, you guys have built out an entire consulting practice, which is remarkable to do it so quickly. You know, our company has pivoted and completely changed uh, in that, you know, we are now really focused on safety and, and wellness uh, compared to just, you know, physical security. And so many others in the category have changed too. So it's a big moment in time for PropTech. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I remember back in March, you know, I mean, it was definitely panic time and I'm still nervous every day. I wake up, I feel like I got to run another marathon. I, th I think the 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 rumors and uh, the speculation of our industry's demise were, were greatly exaggerated and I think unfounded. I think, you know, nobody could have predicted it, but I mean, we're probably one of the few sectors technology to emerge stronger as a result of this so and I th it's obviously a testament to what you guys built that at some point it was going to catch on and I, I wish it wasn't a pandemic that really drove the acceleration and adoption of open path but there you go well it's kind of crazy like and i put a slide in here i remember you know we started the company in 2016 with this idea that you know it was really great to use your mobile phone to unlock the door at the office right and then we launched in 18 and everyone was all about, oh, this is prop tech. This is where the future is going. It's convenience, it's security. And then suddenly in 2019, we're about like touch. And that's what we had to, you know, sort of touch to unlock, touch to do this. And then 2020 hit uh, with the pandemic and everything fundamentally changed. It wasn't about touch, it's about touchless, right? And I know you remember these, you know, the, you know we went through what I think about um, eight or nine different webinars every single week as the <laughs> pandemic set in, just talking about this framework. And we came up with this framework day one, and it's amazing how spot on it has been in terms of you know that phase one of just you know sheltering in place, uh, the phase two which we're still in, which is pre-vaccine, which is you know everybody sort of figuring out what to do, and then now you know thinking about what is it going to be looking like and when is it going to happen that we get to you know, post-vaccine, but pre-immunity. And then of course, what the new normal looks like after that. So as you and I discussed this pendulum that we're swinging back and forth and back and forth on, right? Of everybody, you know, going out, infection right. rates go up, they right. come back in and infection rates go down and we're right. just going back and forth and back and forth. Right. And I think that, you know, this is just uh, remarkably stressful, you know, for all of us. Uh, and yeah. the number to prove it up, so this, Michael, this is actually our uh, nationwide tracking of every unlock that happens across our network. And you can see real-time statistics as over the last couple of months, everything went from lockdown to open up, to go back down, to go back up. And this is what we're seeing every single week as the numbers are just crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, yeah. I just let me just uh, you know give my shout out to, to James, to you and your team, your entire organization, because... Yeah, you've been incredibly supportive of, of Cretech. Um, but I think, you know, when I, when I when I do take a minute, whenever the hell that is, to reflect on what we've all been through over the last couple of months, you know, there's a couple of people and organizations that emerged and, and leaned in and stepped in and said, listen, we don't have all the answers, but we're going to try and we'll be thoughtful and we'll be uh, and we'll, we'll take the lead and we might miss. But let's get out in front of this. And I think, you know, absolutely open path was, in my uh, uh, opinion, one of the real leaders that really emerged uh, in the ecosystem as, as somebody that we could count on when, when this shit does hit the fan 
um, that we can count on open path and its leadership and its support of the sector. So kudos, man. Happy to be uh, doing this with you again. So let's roll, baby. Let's roll. Well, so look, so a lot of things, have, we've learned a lot of things over the last couple of months. Um, there's some new facts that have emerged. And so this was published yesterday by the state of California, uh, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Uh, and it kind of sets the tone. Now, every state's going to be a little bit different, but I figure if what California publishes is worth talking about, I'm sure it's going to be similar uh, across the U.S., right? So as an employer and as someone who thinks about uh, the welfare of all of my employees, I worry about how to get people back to work myself, right? So first couple questions, main employer ask all employees before entering the workplace if they have COVID-19 symptoms. And uh, luckily, the answer is yes. You know, this is something we were worried about in terms of, you know, private health information. What are uh, sort of the puts and takes here? And the reality is so long as you keep the confidential information and the health information of your employees uh, that you obtain, uh, you know, stored confidentially, you can ask them. Right. And then the other things are, uh, can you take their temperature? And this was uh, a highly contested topic. And, and the reality on the ground is that, yes, you can take temperature um, based on the public health guidance that are out there. So that's also really good to know. Uh, buildings can take temperatures, employers can take temperatures. Uh, and then um, actually, can you require people to wear protective equipment? And again, the answer from the government is yes, you can. Uh, and then, um, you know, finally, the other thing is if somebody shows up sick to work or they develop symptoms while they're at work, can you ask them to go home? And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, and so to me, like these are fundamental decisions that we were, you know, trying to figure out if we could make uh, three months ago. And now that we actually have return to work policies in place, uh, we can actually do this stuff. Obviously, check with your individual state, uh, all the disclaimers out there that, you know, the rules might be different wherever you live. But this is at least what the state of California has put in place. So what I wanted to do, Michael is kind of get you to pause for a minute and sit back and say, look, there's been four days right now of uh, you know amazing industry uh, discussions across the CRE tech uh, platform. Uh, what have you heard? What are you seeing? Uh, we'll dive into the survey results that we've done. Uh, we put a huge survey out between OpenPath and CRE tech amongst all the prop tech professionals and folks out there in the real estate world to see how they think about return to work. But I wanted to get your perspective first on, on the last couple of days uh, and what you're seeing. Thanks, James. I mean, uh, it, it's overwhelming, honestly. I mean, I've sat through every session um, and uh, listening to all the comments and all the feedback. And it's overwhelming because, you know, I think since we've been doing this over the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight years or whatever, since Pierce, my partner, got it all going back, back in the day, never in my wildest dreams did I think that we would have the CEO of JLL of Cushman and Wakefield, of Equity Office, of uh, Oxford, uh, COO of Jamestown, on and on, and you know, and, and Brendan, and uh, so many great startups uh, that took the state. Never in my wildest dreams, though, did I think that the real estate industry was going to show up uh, as they did. Now, I, you know, the pandemic. It's unfortunate that the toll that it's taken on so many lives, and I, I don't obviously diminish that because I've, I've lost loved ones, uh, people I know uh, very, you know, closely that have been affected, and some have lost their lives. So, but you know, um, technology and our sector um, emerges stronger than at any other time since we've been doing this. So for the wrong reasons, but we have to all recognize that the world's watching us now. Um, because it's all about work and we're at the center of the storm. And I, I couldn't be more proud of our, of our industry for, and people like you, James, and Open Path for leading us forward. Um, and also I read, a, I read an article this morning um, on, that Axios and uh, Harris had done a poll and 75% of these participants in this poll, you know, thousands, said that they trust corporations more than government. I mean, just think about that, right? So they're trusting us. They're looking at us to bring them back to work, to their home safely. And I feel really good about that we've met the challenge. Um, to hear, you know, the uh, CEOs talk about 
uh, reimagining office, to reimagining the tenant experience, uh, how data will play a role in the ecosystem, how safety and wellness and health are all cornerstones of the industry. I mean, these are things that I never, ever would have thought of, you know, that we'd be talking about at this level, at this time. So I'm, I'm incredibly uh, excited. I, I feel very blessed to be able to say, you know, we put this thing together. We went from a physical conference company to a virtual. Did we did we nail it 100%? No, no effing way. We got a lot of things we're going to learn and do better. But for the most part, I feel really good that we were able to convene all these thousands of people together over the last four days, started out in Europe and now rolling through the U.S. And there's still okay. So I feel really good. Exhausted as always. My team kicked ass. Couldn't be more proud. And I'm just, you know, I'm thrilled that we finally got the world's attention. Now we just got to ensure that these are not just talking points, that this is sustainable and it's going to be ongoing. And I think that's where, you know, your presentation is really going to help us understand. All right. How do we make sure that this is meaningful change, that we reinvent the real estate industry for the better and that, for the first time in my 35 years of being in commercial real estate, people matter more than buildings. Yeah, no, that, that's a, that's actually, I, you couldn't be more spot on. And maybe we jump into the survey results because the point you just made really talks about that. One note for everybody watching and listening, um, Open Path and CRE Tech are gonna make our survey and report available to folks. There'll be a link at the end. And uh, next week we'll be sending that out to anybody who wants to sort of sign up for it. Do you want to make uh, a little bit of money on that? Just a little bit? You can give it all away? You know, this one's going to be- You just raise $36 million, brother. It's for the people, Michael. It's for the people. That's true. Okay. Um, well, let's dive into it. Look, so we put this um, research out. What we did is we, we asked everybody in the community to give us uh, a couple of answers to really poignant questions. And- the, the first result that we saw that was kind of crazy is that um, uh, everyone is mostly concerned about their wellness, right? Uh, so the number one uh, thing that people are stressed about, the highest source of stress is the health of myself and my loved ones. Now, that makes sense, even though we've kind of numbed ourselves to hearing the stats every day and getting used to the fact that this disease is prolific and omnipresent. Um, and then when you dive into that a little bit more, you say, okay, well, if we're super stressed about this, how does that now reflect on return to work? And so you look at the survey results, 63% of everyone's survey said very clearly, they're just not comfortable returning to the office. And you sort of add to that the fact that 70% of those people assume that they actually are gonna be required to be in the office the majority of the time uh, for their job within the year. So remote work is something that we all expect to be a part of the everyday going to work, you know, like that maybe we're going to work two days a week and we're working remote two days a week and maybe we're in a flex space one day a week. 70% of people surveyed uh, who are all across different verticals, tenants, landlords, property managers, property owners, developers, facility managers, as well as every kind of, you know, employee out there tell us that they expect within the next year that they're gonna to need to be back at work. And so if there's all this stress, all this concern about your health and your wellness in the workplace, the next question really is, if we have to get back to work, when do we get back to work? 73% of respondents told us they expect to be back to work within the next two to four weeks, or they are already back at work. So that means there are a lot of people who are going to their offices now who are going into the workplace now or who expect to in the next two to four weeks, that really surprised me because our company has still the, you know, 85, 90% of our employees are still working remote. We're a knowledge worker uh, group. And so we have some essential people, but a lot of folks are expecting they need to go back into the office. And the majority of those folks, 51% of those folks feel that their office is unprepared for them, right? And so you think about all this discussion, all this talk we've been having about for the last four months of getting the built world prepared and ready for a return to the workplace. Yet the sentiment amongst the majority of the employees who have to go back is that their business, their company, their building is not ready for them. And so um, this lends us to, OK, what the hell do we do? 
Like, wh what is it that we can do now? And if you look at all the webinars that we ran, all the smart people in the industry we talked to, every property owner, developer, manager, technologist, uh, architect, uh, you know, software vendor, everybody basically had a whole ton of ideas. And so uh, let's look at what they told us, right? The office needs to be reimagined. We, we totally get that. Uh, we need to reshape how we enter it, how we experience it, how much time we spend in it, and what technology we use to interact and interface with it, right? Uh, and there's a lot of different capabilities that have to be brought to bear here. Um, what's interesting is that when you ask folks, okay, what technologies are in place now, uh, touchless was one of the biggest demand drivers for people, right? 25% of the respondents said that they actually have implemented touchless or safety technologies, actually less than 25%. So that's not a big number given the immediacy of this demand, right? And then we asked, well, is there money to pay for this? Is there money in your corporate budget, in your building budget, in your TI budget to pay for it? And the great majority of folks said that there is existing budget or there is an increase in incremental budget that's been allocated toward it. So the money's there. They just haven't actually been deployed. Or if it's been deployed, it hasn't been communicated out to folks, right? And so uh, when we talked about what are the changes that people want to see in the workplace to feel safe going back, you know, what do you want to have in place? The three top things were uh, a reduced occupancy environment. Uh, touchless access control and hand sanitizer stations. So, um, you know, let's unpack all of those a little bit, right? Uh, capacity management to some degree allows you to have fewer people around, right? So if you think about reduced occupancy, you're going to have different workers coming in at shifts. So that reduces occupancy. You're going to have technology that you can deploy to limit capacity in a given space or room, even if people are showing up, right? And so there's people counters, uh, video surveillance systems with analytics. Uh, there's all kinds of different access technologies, and they all work together. And we named a bunch of vendors here who we integrate with, who we know are doing great things from Density to Verge Sense to Cameo. These folks are all, you know, building systems that monitor and count the number of people in a room or in a space, and then they hand off that information to the access control system, which is open path, and we can actually lock the door if you reach a certain capacity in a room. So imagine the capacity is 20 people. Once you get to 20 people, the people counter from Density or VergeSense sends us a note that says, great, you're at capacity. We lock the door. We don't let the 21st person in. And so that's the kind of technology you can put in place in your buildings right now. We talked about hands-free technology. That's a huge driver for a lot of folks, right? The idea to walk up to a door with your phone in your pocket, simply wave your hand at the door, it unlocks. There's an automatic door opener that you know used to be for ADA compliant doors only and now can be put in place to make sure that it's touchless, germ-free, you don't have to touch anything. Uh, wellness verifications are another way to enforce a clean and sanitary environment. So you can put hand sanitizer stations everywhere, but you want every human to be a good citizen who is doing their best to not come to work sick. So if when you wake up in the morning, you fill out a form that says, I don't have a temperature, I'm not sick, I don't have COVID, then it actually kicks off an enforcement API with Open Path or with another access control system to allow your credential to work when you show up at work. So if you say you're healthy, your credential works and gets you into the office. If you say you're sick or you don't fill it out, you can't get into the office. Uh, and we do the same thing with temperature screenings. So I know this has been a topic that's hotly contested. We just talked about the rules where you can actually test people's temperatures prior to them coming into your building or into your office. Well, now, if you do that in an automated way, if somebody has an elevated temperature, it will actually Re remove the credential. They will actually revoke their uh, credential so that they can't come into the into the building. Whereas if their temperature is below a certain threshold, it will enable their credentials so they can actually come into the building. Um, pain points that people have been sharing with us, 45% uh, of the people surveyed says uh, security is their biggest pain point, right? And that's either the building security, right? Or managing requests for temporary access from guests or contractors who are coming in because you know they're not working on different shift schedules. They're coming in whenever they show up. 
And then also the ability to shift work schedules, another big driver for folks who are trying to sort of have a safer workplace. And so shifting hours on the fly, being able to manage your access control system, your door controls, uh, all of the different schedules that you, you know, have for your employees via remote cloud-based technology means that the IT systems your company's using and your building's using need to be uh, cloud-based. That's a huge driver for people today. And then finally, there's these workplace experience conversations that we had with all of those architects and consultants, right, about how do you improve the way you interact in a common area, and then also how do you deal with the amenities, right? And so, uh, you know, Vocon was one of those really exciting architecture firms that put together a really thoughtful back to work package where they talked about how uh, building owners can change up uh, the ground floor to redefine the space, wider stairwells, repurpose uh, basically sort of the mudroom area for drop offs from food services, uh, obviously touchless access and a host of other things. They talked about tenant corridors being expanded so that you actually uh, can do stuff like, all right, you know, remove a lot of the clutter. People can kind of get by uh, more easily. You have package drop-off areas so that uh, vendors don't have to go up and down in elevators. And then repurposing all of the amenities in the building. Uh, we actually have one of our large landlord partners who's deploying our technology along with a, uh, a tenant amenity app that allows them to uh, issue uh, gym uh, membership uh, reservations. So what you can basically do is uh, if you want to go to the fitness center in the office building, it's now reopened, but you book a membership basically for an hour and then you or a limited number of people are the only ones allowed in with the uh, mobile access credential for that time that you booked the, uh, the access. So a reservation system for a conference room, for an amenity like a gym or for anything else is also super helpful. So those are a whole bunch of the different technologies and capabilities that you know really sort of floated up from our conversations over the last couple of months and also these survey results. We'll make all these results available, like I said, uh, to Michael's uh, chagrin uh, available to everybody. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But uh, let's put it up to Freeman. The freemium you know. model. Hey, uh, that was fantastic. I appreciate all the uh, heavy lifting as usual. So my 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 sort of my question for you for the audience is like, um, so much of the conversations were about uh, big companies, big landlords, big brokerages now, and big tenants talking about reimagining what the work experience is like. Right? Do we come? to connect, to convene, to interact, and then we go back, and then we, we sit at home and we do our deep learning and our, and our deep busy work. What does the experience look like when we come back into that office? And if you listen to the biggest you know, landlords, uh, they're all way out in front, the Brookfields, the RXRs, the Oxfords, the Jamestowns, et cetera, the JLLs, the Cushmans, the they're all talking about it. What, what, what can we do to reimagine with the workplace? And what I am so enthused about in your presentation, James, is that all these technologies that you're talking about, OpenPath and your suite of fellow um, ancillary products that you integrate with, will be things that'll, investments that companies will make that'll be lasting within those buildings and those properties. They're not a fad or a trend. These are tools that'll be here for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, hopefully. And you can also just follow the money in our space. I think it was just this week, I just counted up, it was a couple hundred million dollars invested in the real estate tech ecosystem, all in these categories that you're talking about. No, so yeah. from your perspective and what you're talking to, when you're talking to your clients, I'm sure you're hearing that, that these are the tools that'll, that'll be lasting and the investments that they'll make in these buildings as the nature of work changes. What say you? Well, what would say me is that, um, and you, you mentioned this uh, when we were talking earlier today, the prop tech investments that are being made today have moved from a nice to have to a must have, right? And so when you consider safety and wellness of people in the workplace, and when you consider the evolution of technology that's happened over the last couple of years, uh, there's this alignment that has finally sort of come in uh, where the, the thought leaders at large real estate companies, the folks who are on the calls today uh, and on those Zooms, these are the innovation folks, you know? These are the folks who are driving change in these slower moving real estate companies, right? And this is that moment in time 
where all those folks are realizing, oh gosh, we really do need to do this. And what's really kind of cool is that at least with a lot of the large portfolios that you've mentioned, there have been some really smart, thoughtful folks working on these kind of initiatives for a while. There were proof of concepts, you know, cool tech buildings deployed, lots of initiatives that have been processed. And now what we're seeing happen across not just the broad real estate portfolios, but also across lots and lots of different tenants is their prop tech budgets that they had kind of future aligned in 2021 and 22 are all being pulled into 20. And so now there's this race to sort of see how soon can we get it deployed. And we're seeing that in our pipeline. What we're not seeing, however, in these survey results is the practical, you know, actual deployment happening. So we see a lot of planning a lot of sort of cogs moving, right? But we don't see either the deployments actually happening in the next week, month, or you know quarter, and we don't see a communication happening out to the workers that this is really an investment that has been put in place so that it is safe for you to come back. And to me, that that's a, a disconnect, right? There's a lot of activity yeah. in the space, but there's not necessarily a communication happening with the folks who have to come back to the office. And when we, when you and I were kibitzing earlier, uh, that's my concern, right? That, you know, how do we accelerate actual deployment and adoption? I mean, it's great that Eric's at Lincoln Property and, and you know, Jeff's at Mill Creek and Karen at Avalon and all these great leaders are, are forcing adoption. But, you know, our quest at Cretech remains the same. How do we how do we make this adoption happen throughout the entire ecosystem for the health and wellness of people that come through these buildings and also the planet? So, I mean, what have you seen from the best practices uh, clients that you've been working with? You know how they've adopted um, so uh, aggressively and effectively that you could maybe just share with others to say, here are some steps, here are some practical you know to dos to to get some of these tools implemented. Yeah, so I think um, it, it kind of depends on the nature of uh, the landlord. And and again, this conversation is focused a little bit more on landlords, right? So um, if there is a whole lot of feedback from your tenants that they're worried, that they seek guidance, that they want direction, right? Um, when we talked to Hussein, who's the chief operating officer at Safir, right? He talked about how they're taking a lean in leadership position and they're basically, you know, explaining to their tenants, we've analyzed this, we've thought about it. This is our doctrine and our mission. Here's how we're deploying safety capabilities and technologies in our buildings and we're going. And, and their tenants were taking a lead from them. I think if you look at some of the other, um, you know, larger landlords, what they've done is they've been uh, more... Um, committee driven, right? Which is, hey, you know, big tenant, massive Fortune 500 company, what's your plan? What's your strategy? How can we make sure that we're meeting your needs? Other big tenant, you know, what do we do to make sure that you're happy and everything? And it's, it's an appropriate way to act, but it might not get things done as quickly. And I think that's the challenge. You know, how do you move through the bureaucracy of a large organization to get change implemented quickly and decisively while still making sure your LPs know that you're spending their money right, at, you know, that the asset managers have the right metrics put in place so that the capital budgets are aligned, that the property management teams feel empowered to make decisions rather than sort of get slowed up and, hey, I don't want to spend money because the financial world is sort of coming to the brink and I don't know if I should be deploying capital. And also understanding that your tenants are not at the office right now and they need to come back. And so you have to entice them. You have to sort of show them that you've invested in this stuff. So the over communication that needs to happen to the tenant population is also something that landlords traditionally aren't that good at. Yeah. But I think they're improving quickly at that. No, you're absolutely right, James. It's, it's the final point that I think that uh, Christian, uh, CEO of JLL, made this morning, which was it's, it, it, you have to make it a cultural priority to really emphasize innovation, safety, health, and wellness of, of the people that come through your buildings and your employees. Um, and so it, it starts with culture. So you're absolutely right. So um, let's let's jump into some of these questions though, right, man? Because there's far smarter people out there than me. So um, James, what about an autonomous future as an investment opportunity? Is that the big opportunity that we're talking about? Is that the big category in real estate tech, an autonomous uh, building, everything, uh, you know, the way the buildings are operated. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I don't know if uh, having Skynet run my building is exactly the way uh, I'm going to be comfortable going to the office. I think um, understanding the concept of presence and knowing who's in the building, when they're in the building, and how the building can better uh, curate the experience of an individual as they walk through and experience that, work in the building, interact with it. I think that level of intelligence is important. And having a smart building that has Bluetooth sensors, you know, uh, analytics capabilities from you know a video surveillance perspective to better sense who's there, connected HVAC systems that understand uh, the air quality and the wellness, you know, windows that are actually responsive to you know light changes and temperature changes and you know occupancy data. Those are the kind of things that I think are smart. Uh, but I don't know beyond that how much more autonomy I want the building to have. Uh, you know, like I don't know if I want them to charge me on a variable basis based on how many people are in the office right. uh, or anything like that. You know, somebody should be working on that. All right, this is why I'm not a good moderator because I'm going back and forth to my screens here. And here we got the owner question. Uh, owners are hesitant because they don't see a direct ROI on making some of these investments. I mean, this is what we this is what we've been hearing for years. I don't know that we have a a, a simplistic answer to it, but. Uh, Today, I would say, you know, it's about health, wellness, safety, getting people back into the office. But how do you measure an ROI, you know, for an open path and some of the other tools, you know, that you're such an advocate for? What do you say, what say you to that? Yeah, well, I'd say there's the return to work ROI, which is um, you really would like to have people continue to renew their leases and pay their leases. And if they're not using the space and they're scared to go back to the office, I'm pretty sure uh, the business model of uh, being a landlord is pretty uh, flawed. So investing in safety and security to make sure people are healthy and safe with uh, reduced touching of common touch points, right? Remote management, flexibility to have people shift their work hours so that they can be safe. I, I think those are investments the buildings now need to make rather than just a nice to have. In what terms about of, uh, yeah, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. In terms of the ROI, um, a lot of the capabilities that my peers in the prop tech space have developed uh, are replacing legacy technology that's already in place that you're already paying for. And so, you know, if you have an old elevator system and you upgrade it to destination dispatch, there's efficiencies that come with that. If you have an old access control system, you upgrade it to open path, there's efficiency that come with that. If you have an old video system that's not connected to anything and you upgrade it to one with artificial intelligence that interacts with all of your other applications, there's a lot of efficiency and benefits that come with that. And so what I would argue is that um, when you upgrade the technology stack in the building and you have a more interactive experience, it puts long-term value into your building and you'll see it uh, return back in building valuation, in lower operating costs, and in increased stickiness with tenants renewing. And that's what we've seen right. so far with our large landlords. Well, what the hell do we do with all these temperature screening cameras that we that people are investing in? I feel like those might be a little short -lived. I'm just the moderator, man. I'm just the moderator, all right? No, no. Look, I, I, I think that a lot of the temperature screening stuff is short lived. I think that um, it's not necessarily going to be uh, what's relevant to the next uh, issue that happens. Right. So you look at safety and security stuff, uh, whether it's active shooters or the need to have lockdown capabilities in a building. You look at uh, the need to n mitigate tailgating, people sneaking in behind other folks. Right. You look at uh, the ability to sort of muster folks together in the case of an emergency. All of those capabilities involve video cameras. They all involve thermal recognition, facial recognition, tracking algorithms. Uh, and so putting in a video management system that's smart, that's capable, that's interconnected to all the other things in your building is a good future-proof long-term investment. Is the next pandemic going to manifest in high fevers so that you need to actually be testing people's temperature? I don't know. So I think having smart technology in the building that's flexible and can accommodate and flex to whatever the world is going to present us with is a good investment. Specifically, thermal cameras, meh, I don't know. It's, it's what's necessary right now. Yeah, you know, again, you, you asked me earlier about some of the takeaways that I heard. And, you know, a lot of it, you know, the, the forward-thinking landlords and service professionals, um, the asset managers, owners, investors, you know, what they're looking at is, during this period is by utilizing technology and investing in their properties and uh, specifically 
at some point when the, we do go back to work, whenever that is, and your slides were very helpful, um, I'm a little bit of a pessimist that I think it's going to, just being in the New York metro area, it's going to take a while, um, longer, different regions and what have you. These investments that these big landlords that are making is going to make their buildings more attractive and more valuable because they're going to be able to get tenants back in. And tenants are going to now look at buildings and saying, that's where, you know, my employees feel safer and they're going to go there. So I know that's that doesn't it directly answer that ROI question, but it has to it has to result in assets becoming more valuable um, by having more of these tools where it used to be. You know, if you had, you know, health and uh, club and and, fit and fitness and a pool and, and a gym, that was the amenity. I think now it's about health, wellness and safety um, yeah. for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. And look, the survey results don't lie. People are scared and they're stressed about their own uh, health and wellness and they don't think that their buildings are ready for them. So uh, it's just what the data shows. So um, one can choose to ignore that and say, no, you know what? It doesn't make sense for me to invest in uh, any kind of preparedness uh, or I can do it in a very limited way. That's fine. The question is, will your tenants come back? And will they come back at the rate and pace you want? And then will they use the office space in perpetuity and renew that lease, right? And will right. they keep paying the rates that you expect them to pay? And, and right. that's long-term benefit of having this kind of technology in place because you're future-proofing it. Yeah, Suzanne asked a great question. It's something we talked about at one of the uh, great Open Path uh, webinars that we did about. She said something about a certification system for for assessing and adapting buildings prior to, al prior to allowing tenants back in and gave some uh, some uh, a link there to check out. What do you think about that idea? I think it's a great idea. Oh, I mean, look, there's Wired Score. There's a bunch of different sort of certifications that are out there, but there's nothing that's really uh, presented itself yet that I've seen that is a, you know, return to work, COVID pandemic ready building kind of certification. And I think that would be really interesting. I don't necessarily know um, what it would take to have that in place, but I'd love to be involved in that kind of conversation. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the other question is, um, you know, what is the nature of work that's done in that building? And the certification needs to adapt to the nature of work that's done in that building. Right. Uh, in an industrial building, it's going to be different than in a single tenant building than in a multi tenant building. Right. And so, you know, uh, I, I'm really curious to kind of see how that would evolve uh, based on the nature of the tendency in that space. Yeah, cool. What else didn't we talk about that we should have talked about that's on your mind? Ah. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I'd say this, the one thing that I'm tired of, that you're tired of is, you know, being on Zoom all the time, being on, you know, webinars all the time. And, and but not trying virtual to, conferences. Come on, man. Virtual conferences. But no, no. But, but here's my question uh, really is um, how do we make the experience of interacting online, right, uh, and learning online like we're doing uh, uh, sort of something we want to keep doing, right? Because I'm I'm a little tired of it. You're a little, we're all a little tired of it. So how do we keep it fresh, right? And so how do you think about that? Because that's got to be a big piece of how you're stewarding the, the ship uh, moving forward. How do we keep it interesting so that people want to keep, you know, talking about all this stuff and, and learning? I wish I friggin' knew. Um, yeah. No, I mean, like, look, you know, I don't want to make this an infomercial about Cretec, but you know, we, we have had to adapt to a new world. Uh, and it's, in my opinion, in, in my business, it's permanent. Um, physical conferences will come back, but who knows, 21, 22. But in the meantime, I still have a job to do, which is to help bring you know, uh, adoption to the real estate industry, to embrace technology, innovation, to support wonderful entrepreneurs like yourself. So what did we do over the last four days? I mean, we brought thousands of people together. Extraordinary content. I don't think I don't know that way I would have gotten this, these speakers in a physical event. They would have gotten on a plane, checked their schedule. You know, it's just a different. Um, it's a different ask. It's a different experience. So content's great, uh, but I don't think you can do it every day. Um, I think uh, presentations are great. 
uh, interactivity is great. I think networking is still going to be something that people are going to be challenged to figure out. You know, I don't want to just live on LinkedIn and Zoom calls. So I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity for networking in this virtual world. Um, but I, and again, I think it's, it's forcing all of us just to embrace technology as, as humans to make us more efficient. To, to, you know, I mean, I'm, this is like sort of the, 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 the complicated nature of my particular life is you ask me, Michael, how's this going? I'm going to say, well, you ask me personally and professionally. Personally, I'm living my best friggin' life. I haven't been on a train to uh, Penn Station in, in New York of mass transit experience in four or five months. But my business, you know, depends on people coming together. So we all have to figure out how we're going to be able to do this virtually uh, because I think it's better for us as humans uh, uh, and better for the planet. So a lot of work to be done, but I think we made real progress. And thanks to you, my friend, uh, for all your credible support. Well, look, thanks so much uh, for everything that you guys do. Um, we're really excited to be part of the new online virtual CRE tech, at, just like we were with the offline version. So uh, I appreciate it, my friend. Today the conversation. You know, I'm a huge fan of Open Path, uh, and uh, you personally and the entire team. So we appreciate all your support, your thought leadership, and let's keep it going. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right, buddy.